Thank you, Jean-Paul, and thank you, Renato, for those introduction remarks. We ask ourselves, how do we assess space activities in terms of sustainability? As our two introdu uh, introductory uh, speakers said, things are now very different than the beginning uh, of the space age. There is no plan B, and we need to act. UN sustainability goals should be considered as strong guidelines for space activities. But how do space actors implement them? And can sustainable space be more than an oxymoron? Those are the questions we ask to our three keynote speakers. I'd like to, to introduce Mrs. Simonetta Di Pippo, Director of the UN Office of Art of Space, Mrs. Erin Freund, President of the International Astronautical Federation and Chancellor of the International Space University, and Rudiger Albat, Head of RN5 and Future Preparation at the European Space Agency. Mrs. Di Pippo, the floor is yours. Very much. It was a bit long. The unmuting of uh, the action. In any case, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, it's really uh, a pleasure for me to address this event, uh, covering themes that are increasingly prominent. In uh, in uh, you know when we talk about the future of space exploration and utilization. We have come a long way since the first satellite was launched. After 60 years, space is really a game changer. The data we gather from space give us insights about our history and place in the universe and about the universe itself. The knowledge of our planet, its years and processes, and the impact human activities have on the natural world would be largely incomplete without satellites. And our ability to address global challenges would be very limited without space infrastructure. In some cases, the success would be close to impossible. Activities in this unique environment have truly reshaped our society into a more educated, globalized, and connected civilization. Looking forward simply, there is no future that I can see in which space would not play one of the leading roles. With our dependency on space well established, an increasing number of stakeholders is aware of these realities. The resulting growth in, in appetite to invest financial, human, technological, and political resources translates into an even an ever more diverse and expanded decade is an apt manifestation of this trend. The space sector was blooming as at a faster pace than the global economy. Standing at over 420 billion US dollars, the space economy now sits 53% higher than in 2010. In comparison, global GDP saw only 20.8 increase in that same time period. In 2020, we could not see any sign of a slowdown despite the global pandemic. The space community launched over 1,260 satellites, more than doubled, doubling the record figures set in 2019 and representing over 10% of all functional objects placed in orbit just in one year. This rapid growth of the space industry is in principle amazing news. But let's not forget one important thing. Space is a finite resource. The safety, security, and long-term sustainability of other space activities cannot be taken for granted. United Nations has stood at the center of multilateral collaboration since the beginning of the space era, serving as a platform to identify arising challenges and seek appropriate solutions. Much has been achieved over the years under the umbrella of the UN. Five treaties and five principles are the most visible legacy, but the work continues. The Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space adopted uh, the Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines a bit ago, a great result of the liberations that started already in the late 80s. And a decade-long effort of a dedicated working group produced the guidelines on the long-term sustainability of other space activities adopted by all COPIUS member states in 2019. 
the importance of achieving global consensus on how <laughs> to describe responsible and sustainable behavior in space should not be underestimated. But we must remain vigilant. After all, putting words on paper is only half of the story. For example, the population of debris keeps growing and with it the risk of conjunctions, which could, in the worst case scenario, leave the orbit so congested that it would be of limited use. If the pace at which satellites were launched in 2020 will be sustained or even amplified throughout this decade, the society will soon run into serious problems. Projections are very clear in this regard, as is the conclusion that we must move beyond words when we talk about space sustainability. It is high time we double down on all aspects, international politics, policy, governance, as well as science and tech innovation to preserve space for future generations. First and foremost, we must remain vocal about the necessity to maintain space for peaceful purposes. The stability of the status quo is of utter importance. The geopolitical circumstances have not always favored harmonious relations on Earth. Fortunately, Space has always been the example of how productive international cooperation can beat all the odds. And we must do all in our power that it remains this way. Secondly, we must take due regard on the environmental perspective of space sustainability. As we look across the spectrum of human activities, businesses and industries, we can find many warning signs. In many sectors, Ignorance and hunt for economic gains at all costs have led to destructions of habitats, livelihoods, even societies. Biodiversity loss, climate emergency, health crisis, all stemming from irresponsible, human-centric and profit-driven behavior. We need to do things right in our own industry so that our space efforts do not become yet another highly problematic and controversial field and in um, an already troubling period we live in. And here I talk about three aspects. Sustainability of celestial bodies in the light of novel space operations and behavior of those bodies aligning with the highest standards on transparency and responsibility. This is to avoid at all costs disputes between different stakeholders, but also to consider both forward and back contamination. Moreover, sustainability of Earth in terms of impact of space activities in areas surrounding launch pads, emissions from launches, as well as impacts of ray entries on the atmospheric composition. And finally, sustainability of near Earth space to ensure the preservation of this unique environment so that space operations can continue unimpeded by high risk of conjunctions or even more severe implications of uncontrolled spaceflight activities. We know that space has the power to change the world we live in, yet, let's not oversee long-term prosperity and sustainability with the sight of short-term profits. New space must lead by example, be full of responsible stakeholders who work hand in hand in a transparent, open and collaborative manner to protect these global commons and protect and improve well-being on earth in return. We must balance the excitement and energy surrounding the near-term gains of doing space today with the wisdom and stamina of knowing that only through careful custodianship will we realize the true potential of an interconnected earth space ecosystem over the long term. Through proactive multilateralism, we can build that stakeholder rather than shareholder, shareholder space economy for the benefit of all. Only through responsible, sensible, and mutually respectful behavior, we can achieve and maintain maintain economic, political, and environmental sustainability in space, bringing long-term prosperity and harmony with the natural world. The Office for Outer Space Affairs does its share of the work towards such sustainable progress in space. And as a convener, we provide unique platforms for discussion. The recent success of the second World Space Forum is a great example of convening stakeholders from all corners of the society to identify best solutions along the pillars of space economy, space society, space diplomacy, and space accessibility. 
Additionally, while our capacity building activities focus on expanding the user base of our space assets, as well as access to space, we assign utmost importance to responsible behavior. We are actively helping states to abide by the existing international space law and other relevant frameworks. The space law for new space actors projects supports the development of an enhanced understanding of the fundamental of space law and its implementation. And with thanks to recent agreement with the UK, the UAE space agency and the UK government, we will fully support international efforts promoting space sustainability. Indeed, only by working together, reinforcing dialogue and exchanging best practices among established and emerging space faring nations, we can preserve space and accelerate its use for sustainable development on Earth and beyond. Whether we talk about exploring the mysteries of near and deep space, or we focus on the utilization of satellites to improve our life on Earth, we, one thing is beyond doubt. Human society needs a prosperous space industry that upholds the highest standards of responsibility and transparency so that this generation and all that are to follow can benefit from what this unique environment offers. If we all join forces in this common mission, I'm sure we will get there. Thank you very much for listening. I know I'm the next speaker, but I'm not sure if I should uh, start unannounced. <laughs> you can start. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, and 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 dear organizers. Uh, I'm I'm very honored uh, to address you at the first Sustainable Space Logistics Digital Symposium here at F, uh, here EPFL. And of course, as it has been already discussed, this is a very opportune topic because uh, today a large proportion of our global economy from telecommunication, banking and transport to disaster prediction, monitoring and defense, uh, just to name a few sectors, are really more, more and more reliant upon uh, space-based infrastructures. And space solutions not only provide us with irreplaceable services, such as uh, internet, um, it um, contributes, uh, um, space contributes really also in addressing matters of food security, energy security, economic security, climate change has been mentioned today and many other topics. So we count right now more than uh, 70 government space agencies and offices worldwide. And I think there are 14 or 15 countries which launch capabilities and even more countries benefit uh, from having their own satellites in space. And over 50% of all space mission, that's an important number are conducted on the basis of international cooperation. So that is also as Simonetta and others said, it's important to, uh, 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 really foster this international dialogue in order to solve uh, um, everything and in particular also sustainability of space activities. So um, I, I would just uh, touch on three uh, uh, small topics of, uh, containing, uh, uh, you know, I, under this topic of sustainable space, uh, namely climate change, orbital debris and also planetary protection. And I will try to share some slides. I hope that actually, um, uh, I hope that actually works. Uh, I'm gonna try if that works. And uh, we'll see. Can you see that? One of, I think. Okay, so um, I wanted to, to make a connection uh, to the European Green Deal. Uh, I think more than ever, we all share uh, the, the sentiment that space is key for a better understanding of our Earth system. 
a better understanding of how we actually can uh, mitigate climate change and for supporting you know, our socioeconomic uh, development in the years to come. And the European Green Deal, um, as it being the plan of the European being commissioned to make Europe's economy sustainable, has really set several pillars. Uh, for instance, to boost the efficient use of resources uh, by moving uh, to a clean circular economy to restore biodiversity and cut pollutions, and also to be climate neutral in 2050. And I think when we look at the EU uh, space program and all the activities on the national level and from the European Space Agency, we really see that uh, 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 space really directly supports uh, the Green Deal actions, in particular, of course, the U EU Copernicus program in cooperation with ESA and uh, many other organizations. It contributes to the key objectives of the EU Green Deal, uh, namely to uh, achieve net zero emission, investing in green technologies, um, and also protecting our natural environment and this information is provided by the by the copernicus services uh, can uh, be used by uh, many end user, users for a wide variety of applications and uh, it be it smart smart cities or clean energy sustainable agriculture uh, maritime security transport and mobility there are so many subjects um, this developing um, downstream sector is vital and increases also uh, space awareness. So um, uh, we discussed it already, and I will keep this topic short. Uh, all the other the, the other speakers of today have already addressed this topic, and of course, uh, being uh, in Switzerland, being very prominent in this subject, you will also discuss that much more during this conference. But when you look at the data from September 2020, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, more than 2,700 active satellites in space. Um, nearly 2,000 of them are in low Earth orbit. And um, we had additional launches of the Starlink and also OneWeb uh, constellations. So um, uh, I think uh, what is important is to say that the low Earth orbit is really congested and that um, also already now more of the launches are dealing with um, parts of mega constellations. And uh, as it has been said uh, also by Renato, the, satellite, the small satellite market is really following a positive trend and uh, we will have more and more launches, up to 1,000 launches in the, in the next uh, per year and in, in the next decade. And that, of course, translates to uh, the growing space debris. And certain orbits really get crowded and congested. And uh, when we look... Uh, at the data from, from last year, and of course they are changing uh, rather free, uh, frequently, we have now 29,000 objects, which are larger than 10 centimeters, uh, which can be uh, somehow measured because there are, there are methods to, to uh, uh, really uh, follow them. Uh, we have, um, the, the, when you look at the literature, there are uh, many different numbers, but roughly 900,000 objects which are larger than one centimeter. And you have a really an undefined number, probably going up to 170 million of objects which are smaller uh, than uh, a, a one centimeter. And uh, so uh, between one millimeter and one centimeter. And that is really something which will only get worse as has been uh, discussed. And there are, uh, I think, a lot of important um, uh, actions to take uh, from tracking to active debris removal. And I don't want to continue on that because you have already discussed how active actually um, uh, Switzerland is with this uh, first really uh, 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 is a clear space one mission in cooperation uh, with many actors. And I think it is very exciting and I think it will have a, 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 a special session on that. So um, I come to my last topic of space exploration um, because this is also an extremely dynamic field. We have looked at satellites, we have discussed a lot of topics today, but also space exploration is a really, really dynamic field. And uh, it is uh, actually a multi-stakeholder approach because there are a lot of new uh, space actors which are actually entering and there are more and more emerging countries 
uh, and developing countries which are interested and want to be a part you know, of missions uh, in the Earth, Moon, Mars space, in particular, Moon and, uh, 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 and Mars and near us asteroids. And um, so there are more missions which are planned uh, and it's actually exciting and uh, new activities are planned to uh, lower Earth's orbit, to Moon, to Mars and beyond by many actors, US, ESA, uh, China, Russia, Japan, India, but as we have seen also emerging space nations and the United uh, Arab Emirates has been very successful uh, with its arrival of its, its Hope Orbiter at Mars uh, a, a few days ago. So, um, uh, the deep space exploration uh, and technology market is expected to show is, uh, also a significant growth. This is the same like uh, for the small satellite market that we have discussed before. And so, it is, of course, a question, how do we shape a sustainable long-term space exploration program? So, and uh, as uh, has been already discussed, international cooperation is really a key it's an important factor to, to share costs, uh, to eliminate uh, duplication and exploit worldwide expertise, because you have to design a lot of innovative technologies for large scale robotic or human exploration endeavors. So there is, um, of course, coordination uh, um, and there is the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, ISEC-G, which acts as a platform to compile um, activities of now, I think, 24 space uh, nations for better coordination. And uh, sustainability um, uh, also involves uh, the deep space exploration uh, um, uh, that, that it also offers benefits for um, non-space sectors and for us on Earth. And there are many, and I think this is much, uh, uh, is not very often communicated, but also space exploration is really uh, important. It can uh, uh, benefit other space sec uh, other uh, non-space sectors on Earth, uh, for instance, for hydrogen fuel cell technology, robotics, uh, propulsion, uh, hardware and, and, and software and healthcare, as we have seen now in the health crisis and, and many more. So this is also something which uh, I think will make a space exploration more sustainable for the future. So, uh, due to the dynamic space exploration sector, there is really a growing uh, need to establish more comprehensive regulations. We have discussed already about space law, uh, of course, also concerning uh, you know space traffic management and or, and orbital debris. Also, for for um, uh, space exploration, we really need um, uh, um, I, I would say planetary stewardship. We need. Uh, uh, probably a lunar environmental protocol, uh, because many missions also from industry and startups are targeting uh, now the moon in the very near future, but also looking in the future to other targets. Uh, and we have to do that uh, in, in, uh, in due time, so not when it is too late. So over the past five decades, uh, the international space community has developed a complex framework, you know, that balances exploration and also the use of assets. Uh, but this does not really apply to space environments beyond uh, Earth's orbit. And I think there's a lot of work to be done by space lawyers, but also organizations like UN COPOS, Coast Bar, the International Institute of Space Law, and other international organizations, which really have to look uh, at uh, guidelines, frameworks, and uh, then uh, really uh, probably not treaties, but uh, in, important uh, regular uh, regulations uh, which are agreed upon in a multi-stakeholder uh, approach. So finally, I just uh, want to highlight the work of the International Astronautical Federation being uh, the president uh, since 2019. So, the IF is uh, the largest space advocacy network in the world with 400 uh, members, uh, 407 actually, members from 71 countries, and this includes all the leading space agencies and universities, industries, uh, professional society, R&D organizations, as you can see here on the screen. And um, the IF is doing that actually for 70 years. It's the 70th anniversary in 2021, and the IF has been really providing the platform for the entire space community to meet 
share and connect, which of course right now in this uh, unprecedented times is a little bit difficult. Uh, but we have um, at the IF many uh, um, administrative, but also technical committees, uh, which address sustainable space activities. And we have just created a new uh, technical committee for space traffic management. So I hope uh, to see you at the IF um, Global Space Exploration Conference in St. Petersburg in, in June, or at the International Astronautical Congress in Dubai in, in October. And I wish you a great uh, conference in the next days. So, and stop sharing. I think I should be fine. <laughs> Thank you. This is Rüdiger Albert speaking. I'm the next on the list. I hope that you can see what I have on my screen. So you can see your screen right. You got the cre screen, that's okay. Yes. Okay, it's perfect. Fine. So dear EPFL, first of all, thanks a lot for this invitation. Thanks a lot for having set up this uh, first symposium on sustainable space logistics. And yes, my congratulations, you have become the center for these topics in Europe in the last years. So I'm very proud to be part of it today. I think that Pascal and Simeta, Simonetta make it perfectly clear that space is now a centerpiece of Earth of economy and a centerpiece for Earth environment and that we have to preserve this ecosystem and keep the access to space open, meaning that we have to do things right. My keynote of about 10 minutes will illustrate with some examples how we try at ESA to do things right. I wish to illustrate that through different fields by a short journey through the space transportation ecosystem as we see it at ESA. I know that this slide is a little bit overloaded with lots of vectors and rockets going in all senses, but I try here to show you what space transportation logistics really means for ESA and what ecosystem behind means. You see here on the left side a lot of activities from Earth and around Earth. On the right side you see travel going to moon and going to mars and then again you see activities and services on these planets planets and around these planets the logistics standpoint and the ecosystem uh, idea means that all these services all these products all these needs have synergies and are connected like a real ecosystem and uh, in this connection, we will find a lot of possibility to do things right and better. I've selected here a couple of examples, which are green. To start on the left side uh, with the launch of a mission from a green spaceport, looking then into concrete examples of uh, eco design, coming back to the debris removal and illustrate what we have seen in the slides from uh, Pascal right before, and ending with green propulsion. Please allow me now to leave this uh, ecosystem and to jump into the first example. The first example is the spaceport, Europe spaceport in French Guiana. Here on the picture, you see what it is. It is green, it is windy, and it is sunny. But if you look into the middle, what I see there is, is nearly the same picture I could have taken 35 years away ago when I traveled for the first time to Guyana to work in the launch team. So the infrastructure we see here is very, very uh, aged and coming out of the pioneer areas. So this gives best conditions for sustainability, best opportunities to decrease energy consumption, best opportunities to reduce waste, to start to produce green energy with all the sun, all the biomass and all the wind we have there. 
good opportunities to produce in situ green propellants. All these opportunities have been bundled in a big initiative with a first uh, bunch of investments. And the good news is on the right side of the uh, slide, these costs pay off. It uh, brings not only a reduction of all environmental footprints, it brings also a reduction of the bill. First example, become greener on ground on earth. Second example in this slide shows you that we do in space now and in uh, space uh, industry uh, things just as in other industries, as in other transport industries, like, auto, like the automotive industry. The idea of life cycle assessment has become has become the basis of our work, and we. In, at ESA and also in industry, think now in life cycles from cradle to grave. We go through all, and this you see on the right side of the slide, uh, different life phases of uh, services and products from design over production, launch, use, up to disposal. And in each phase of the life, we try at our best to reduce the use of resources emissions and environmental impacts. So this is not space specific, but you should know that this is part of our daily requirements and work today. The next example has been already discussed and on the left side, you see a little illustration why among others, we should avoid the space debris. There you have a nice, uh, collection of objects which uh, entered to Earth and they came back because they were so good designed against hostile environments that they survived the hard ride back to Earth through the atmosphere. In the background, you see our, um, our cargo to ISS coming back, ATV, the first one of a, long, of a row. And you see there that this ATV disintegrates in many, many debris pieces. And this is something which is done by design. The first thing you can do to avoid uh, debris to fall back on earth is to do it by design and to allow early break up in smaller pieces of the spacecraft during re-entry. The second thing which you see there is that it is controlled deorbiting, meaning that we do it by steering and by propulsing the vehicle back into the higher levels of atmosphere for controlled re-entry, typically over the Pacific region to make sure that none of the remaining debris can hit, uh, can, can hit Earth. It's all, if something comes back, it comes back to sea. So avoid debris coming back to, to Earth. That's one thing. The second topic, and uh, Pascal has already showed a photograph on it, is to remove space debris, which is already in space. And what you see here on the slide are two parts of the mission. The left part of the mission is what we do today. The standard ascent phase, where you see a launcher, which separates his fairing, separates uh, the first a satellite and then a second one and then bringing back, um, coming back to Earth. What is new is on the right side, where we use the same upper stage, the same uh, elements of the launcher to perform a rendezvous, to capture a target and to bring it back to Earth. And this you see on the right. So we use the ascent mission and the remaining energy on board to do a descent mission afterwards and to remove and to catch, catch debris. This will be done. This will be done with Swiss technology. It will be done in an ESA program called Clear Space One, and it will be demonstrated already in four years. The fifth example is to better use what we have. Now, there's lots of space infrastructure is, uh, at the end of its life, and it is worth thinking of uh, extending its life using vehicles which are launched by launches with have, which have extra performance on board. And this happens very regularly on Ariane, it happens, and we have already done it. 
to dock to satellites and to give them a second uh, life, to transport them either to new orbits or to extend simply their lifetime by additional propellants, or at a later stage to upgrade them with, uh, with new equipment. Last example I have in a row, and then I will, will stop, is a zoom on green propulsion. On the left side, you have the past. You have uh, Ariane 5, uh, Ariane 4, uh, with uh, at each launch about 400 tons of toxic propellants on board, meaning that over the 116 Ariane 4 launches, more than 50,000 tons of these propellants were produced. I will not go into the details. I will let you read. This meeting is being recorded. I hope you that hope the video that will, will, go. will go. Is there still is an echo? No, it's gone. Perfect. So all this needed uh, highly protective measures to avoid any contamination of the operators and of the, the environment. And all this is simply no more possible. We need to do things right. And on the right side, you have some examples how we intend to do things right. And uh, starting from now, we will... We will <laughs> in the future use green propellants for for launches there's the example of prometheus we will use it for attitude and role control we use it on satellites on kick stages on landers all over in the ecosystem and all this is a perfect example for synergy because these developments we only do them once and then we allow all the ecosystem to make best benefit of it so this ends my presentation I hope that you take home some messages that uh, sustainability is more than words, that it is reality of our daily life to get, uh, together today, and that we, nobody waits until tomorrow to, to start to put this into practice. Thanks a lot. I'm through the presentation and I hand over to to Emmanuel again. Hello. Thank you very much, everyone, for those interesting opening remarks. I think all speakers agreed we are now in a state of emergency. There is no plan B and there is a need to act. The space economy is shifting, the space traffic is increasing. All speakers did mention the thematic of uh, the need to protect the space environment. From a, also a space debris uh, perspective, we need to avoid them, we need to remove them, we need to extend them to extend life also of space objects. And for that, there was also a few examples of development of technologies that are developed within EPFL. Um, and also example of missions that was also described by uh, Rudiger Albert. There is also a need also to act for planetary protection and to avoid any kind of uh, contamination. We also discussed, um, there was also discussion about uh, climate change and how also space activities should avoid to have an impact on the climate, uh, meaning through the utilization of uh, green propulsion, but also in optimizing our uh, launch infrastructure. Last but not least also, our speakers mentioned that there is a need also for international cooperation, multilateralism, um, and with also example of few places where actors can collaborate uh, together through, for example, development of the Lunar Protocol, through the activities of the UN uh, Committee of Peaceful Use of Outer Space, but also the activities of the International Astronautical Federation. I see that now um, we are, it's the time for our first break. Um, we understand it's difficult to stay always in front of the screen. So we schedule the five minute breaks. There's gonna be a short video if you want to stay. Otherwise you can go grab a coffee, make technical break. And then we'll see you again in five minutes for our panel discussion with Spacewatch Global um, on the topic, are we, are we do, uh, are we, overdoing it with the sustainability. Thank you very much. See you in five minutes. <laughs>